willkommen äh, zu diesem Webinar. Great, a very warm welcome to you all to our webinar. This time there's something to digest for your brains at lunchtime. And I have invited very interesting, fascinating experts, and we have our interpreters. Welcome to them. Just a quick word to one of the interpreters to switch off his camera. There you go. Thank you, Ralph. Now, let me say, the EU Commission tomorrow will present its package of rules, of laws, the Green Deal Fit for 55. So I don't know who thinks of these titles. You know, we have the Kita, the um, nursery law from Berlin. You know, we have weird names in German for our laws and regulations, but the Brussels um, responsible people, they're um, not lagging behind here. So now we want to change competition policy. The EU Commission wants to change the rules for competition policy. And we have very interesting and important issues here. What about state aid to start with? So not to shock you too much. I guess most of you will speak English. Don't worry, we have a um, we have interpreters. You can choose. Would you like to listen to English or German? And what's more, the interesting question here is, what is the Commission going to do when revising its competition policy? Now, I'm really happy to have Mr. Winterstein here from the um, Director General that is responsible and a number of experts who will have their say. Um, I have the project of a Green Action Plan with our proposals for reforming the competition policy. Thanks to my Mira puts my um, assistant here. Great job here. You've received all the information via email. Now, the Europe Calling webinar. We are getting closer to 100 issues, 100 um, webinars. But well, we're always friendly and polite. But we want to um, call a spade a spade. And we're happy to have different opinions. We're happy to hear what you have to say. Everything you say here is public, it's recorded. So whenever something fascinated is said, don't hesitate. Do send it out on uh, social networks. You can find it on YouTube or Twitter afterwards. But this also means that when you take the floor, this is something you have to take account of. It, it's recorded and it might find its way in the outside world. I'm not sure from a legal perspective whether that's quite correct, but we haven't had any complaints from the thousands of participants that we've had. Other than that, we're happy to have written um, feedback in the chat, proposals, anything you would like to get uh, off your chest or would like to suggest. Anything that you find important, you can also give a thumbs up if you agree with something or find it um, significant. Now, let me pass the floor to the EU Commission as is customary in Brussels. What are your plans? Do tell us all about the proposals ahead. Do tell us everything with the Winterstein. You have the floor and we're very curious as to what you have to say. Members of Parliament, dear Sven Giegold, I'll be switching to English now in my uh, speech. For having me, I will be uh, short. That has been my main, uh, my main uh, task. Now, um, what I would like to do in this five minutes that I have is, is, is explaining to you where we are coming from in the Commission, but in particular in DG competition, because. Uh, it has been said many times that uh, the Green Deal is a priority uh, for the European Commission, but also for Parliament, Council and the rest of Europe. What we want to do is transform the European economy into an economy that is more fair, more just, uh, more modern, more resource efficient and more resilient. So that's the, that's the task. Now, uh, who is going to deliver that? Well, the answer is um, both at the European level and in the member states, the legislator, and I say this deliberately in a webinar hosted by a member of the European Parliament. It is parliamentarians uh, who, uh, together with, um, with uh, the member states, who will decide on how to tackle it. The Green Deal, but of course, Fit for 55, the package that um, 
Mr. Giggold mentioned, which will be in college uh, tomorrow, that will uh, present a lot of detail, uh, a lot of important detail on how we can get to the ambitious uh, resources, um, um, sorry, um, reduction in, in emissions that we're all striving for. So I say very deliberately, the answer to this challenge is coming from the democratically legitimate, but also accountable politicians. Um, the legislators, both in Europe and in the member states. So where does this leave competition policy? And there, um, that's something which is maybe not often understood. I think competition policy is playing a very important role because it is competition policy that keeps markets functioning. It keeps markets fair. Uh, it, make, it, it keeps markets operational. So then, in fact, all the price signals, all the incentives which the legislators put in their laws in order to change behavior uh, and to change incentives, all this will only work if markets work properly, if companies, if market players, if consumers are able to respond to these signals in the way the legislator has intended. And that only works if markets work properly, and they only will if competition works properly, and competition will only work if uh, people like my colleagues and myself, but also in the member states, uh, make it so. Um, it is also very important, competition is also very important for innovation. If there's one thing that will help us to get, uh, to get ourselves uh, towards the ambitious targets, but also out of this uh, economic crisis here in the pandemic, it is going to be innovation and nothing boosts innovation more than competition. And finally, uh, the stated rules that uh, Mr. Giggold mentioned uh, play an important part um, also in, 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 the, in the aspect of transition, because obviously uh, not every member state starts from the same uh, starting point, a different energy mixes, different uh, economic structures. So uh, the speed needs to be adjusted and, and, and people and countries need to be taken along. And this is also one of the things that stated policy uh, can do. So to summarize, the legislator takes legislative action, competition policy supports by making markets work fluidly. We do that in all our instruments. Stated, I think, is going to be the heart of this discussion uh, here, but there's also uh, antitrust. The question, how do companies cooperate? How can they together uh, reach um, ambitious uh, agreements and implement them without uh, falling foul of the competition rules, without greenwashing? Nobody wants greenwashing, so the competition rules are there to prevent that. And our merger rules, of course, are very important to prevent companies from becoming too economically powerful, which is then to the detriment both of the consumers, but also of innovation. Again, innovation is key, and vibrant competition will preserve innovation, which is why uh, merger policy is so, is so important. So let me conclude on state aid in particular. Uh, because of the important role of competition policy, our commissioner, Margrethe Vestea, has triggered um, a consultation process last uh, fall uh, with a large public consultation with a conference to which uh, Mr. Giggold has also participated um, and, and, and sort of which is now drawing to a close uh, uh, very soon. But in parallel, of course, in parallel, many important stated instruments, but also antitrust instruments are being reviewed, are being reformed. And uh, as we speak, not only Fit for 55 uh, tomorrow, but also today, my colleagues, other colleagues of mine, are discussing with their opposite numbers in the member states on the latest draft that we put out for public consultation of the uh, energy and environmental aid guidelines, um, for which the public consultation is open until the beginning of August. So I would urge everybody who is listening today, who is watching us, to, uh, and if you have a view, then please let us know in this public consultation. Um, these new guidelines um, will, will, will feature a number of things, which, by the way, also are in, in the paper, Mr. Giko, that you have uh, put forward. So you will, I think you will, be, you will be at least partly happy. You will see a broadening of, uh, of the scope of the guidelines. You will see more flexibility, but you will also see a couple of important uh, safeguards and a stronger push to ensure coherence with relevant European legislation and, and policies. Um, I would like to stop here to give time to the others to speak as well. And then if there are questions or further, further queries about these guidelines, which I think are the most important ones for today's discussion, then of course, I'm very happy to provide those details. But now I'd like to give back to you and to my co-panelists. 
Thank you, Alexander. It uh, would be great uh, to put in the chat if there are timelines to be respected and foreseeable timelines, please share them with the audience. But now I give immediately the floor to Juliette. Today we have again, I have to say in my webinars, a certain concentration of lawyers, which always makes me a bit nervous. You can't work without them and with them, it's also not always easy. So Juliette, your proposals for greening competition policy. Your microphone is muted. Sorry for that. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I hope you can understand uh, my lawyer's uh, speech and that it's not going to be too complex. Um, I think we, we very much welcome the, the parliament's uh, increasing involvement into these discussions on competition policy and the alignment with the Green Deal. Um, I also think your uh, draft action plan is identifying very well some of the core issues we're also looking at. Um, I will just limit myself to some remarks on state aid. Overall, at Clanters, we think it, we are at the stage where we need compliance, we need consistency, and we need accountability of the Commission, of the member states, of the businesses, um, and, um, and it's the only way we are going to, to achieve the goals uh, that we have set for ourselves. Um, just a general remark, generally we speak about aligning competition policy with the Green Deal. Um, if I may, we have had for decades a uh, much stronger legal basis than the Green Deal for that. We have had the treaties, we have Article 11 and Article 9 of the treaty calling for uh, alignment of union policies with protection of the environment and of human health. And I think it's about time that we start referring to those as well, uh, in addition to, uh, to the Green Deal, because they're supposed to drive our action. Um, and the stated guidelines for climate, environmental protection and energy should be the first ones to integrate those, uh, those legal bases. We can't still be in a position to cherry pick uh, Article 107 over and the internal market uh, over, over environmental protection, whether they should be pursuing the same goals. Um, the same goes for uh, compliance of uh, businesses with union law. Uh, that also is a long-standing principle uh, for them to receive state aid. That Court of Justice recalled very clearly recently. And we are the stage where we need to be really checking this compliance and that the companies and the businesses are going to the right direction and contributing to the global efforts as well. Um, one point I found very interesting in your draft action plan was the call for an increasing involvement of civil society and for the commission to uh, actually admit civil society observations uh, and contribution to stated procedures. It's a the procedural obstacle we have faced and we understand that the Commission will be increasingly relying on, uh, on the public uh, to also identify breaches of union law by, uh, by enterprises when the member states or the businesses don't provide proper information themselves. But it goes with you know, giving proper procedural rights to them as well. Um, one small remark, if I may, um, you have been mentioning that the Commission has proposed to amend the IRS regulation to open uh, internal review of stated decisions. It's in fact not really the case. The Commission is still not proposing to allow uh, access to justice to third parties in stated cases. The Parliament has very uh, well put that in an amendment and proposed to amend uh, the regulation, but the Commission is still not. And we believe it's still a violation of international law so we're very curious to see how the union would justify itself uh, at the meeting of the parties in October. Um, on some uh, two more specific remarks concerning the stated guidelines, but also obviously the decarbonization objectives we are pursuing. Um, I think we very much align with, uh, with your position uh, at the Greens that we need to stop state aid to fossil fuels, not only the most polluting ones as the commission is mentioning in the guidelines, we are at the stage where we just, you know, uh, one cycle of investments away from, from the climate targets, and we can't be supporting by state aid uh, future stranded assets and in what, 10, 15 years from now, paying them to phase out uh, as we are paying the coal plants to phase out at the moment. And um, so we still see with quite a lot of concern, uh, the permissive and quite ambiguous regime uh, the commission is, is putting in the draft state aid guidelines for climate and, and energy at the moment. Um, with so-called conditions that we, we are quite worried about the ambiguous language. Um, in the same uh, vein, um, I think we also need to clearly balance the need for the industry to develop and decarbonize um, and 
perhaps avoid this risk of carbon leakage. But we need to make sure that the exemptions they would benefit from are not going to discourage them uh, to contributing to the global efforts as well. So we need to draw a fair balance between uh, the conditions they are set um, and the aid they can receive. So overall, again, I think we need we need consistency into our approach, into the laws, into the policies, um, and, and we need accountability of all stakeholders uh, involved. Um, so again, we very much welcome the role of the parliament into uh, ensuring this, this consistency of approach and the interaction between the stated rules, competition policy and secondary legislation is increasingly important. Um, and so we need to have a proper, uh, a proper mindset, which is very, uh, very global on these issues. Um, I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussions um, and to the other participants' comments. Thank you. Yes, and this was, of course, uh, Juliette de la Rue of Client Earth, Lawyers uh, for the Planet, I always call them, or now we say Lawyers for the Future. Uh, so uh, thanks for this. So now to my uh, good, uh, I would even say friend, uh, Professor Repasi, we have been walking a long way now in European legislation, you as an academic, uh, myself as an MEP. So, but originally you came from an institute concentrating on economic and competition law. So therefore your perspective as professor at the Erasmus University uh, for European law is in particular interesting. René, you have the floor. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Sven, for having invited me to hear. For the public that is regularly in these webinars, they might be a bit surprised that I'm now talking competition law because I normally talk about things like, like Brexit and uh, European constitutional questions. But indeed, I'm coming from European economic law and I'm also teaching competition law here at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And the subject of this, uh, of this debate today is uh, also quite uh, um, highly debated amongst my students. Uh, they are not so much interested in industry 1.0 competition law, but what does that mean in terms of climate protection, data protection, and all these, let's say, extra competition goal or non-competition uh, goals and how competition law plays into this. Half of the master thesis that I'm supervising is actually about this and students thinking about this problem. So there is, uh, there is a huge interest, uh, certainly in the younger generation, how that is, which brings me to my first remark. And that's, let's say, the more general debate that we here have. Here. What is the relationship between regulation and competition policy? Because the commission has, to my understanding, a very traditional understand, uh, understanding of this, that regulation, uh, when it comes to climate protection, et cetera, should be the main tool to work with. And there should be then uh, laws, regulations, etc., done, um, and thereafter the markets should operate in their classical way next uh, to each other. And um, the, the role that competition policy plays in enforcing the decisions made by regulation is, now yeah, let me put it like this, some national competition authorities are a bit more progressive in that regard. So here I also may want to draw your attention to the draft sustainability guidelines presented by the Dutch Competition Authority just recently, that are very progressive in taking into consideration climate change and say sustainability issues when looking at competition policy. Uh, so in that sense, we'll see what how the package looks like it is going to come uh, and whether the commission is opening up itself more in including non-competition goals in uh, the definition of their competition policy. Now, um, in uh, very generally said, NIA state aid indeed also in the draft paper uh, made by uh, Sven Giegold is, is in the heart of the debate for obvious reasons, since uh, legally speaking, uh, all state aid is prohibited and the commission can um, exceptionally allow it. And that makes it, let's say that uh, whatever flows is always prohibited and the commission can define criteria to actually open the gates. That makes it a bit easier to work with than the other way around if something is allowed in general, and then prohibition in terms of regulation has to be introduced first. So in that sense, I believe the potential that is seen by uh, adjusting uh, guidelines, etc., to including uh, climate, uh, climate goals is an interesting and uh, the right one. One has, however, to see before we come to those guidelines, they work at the level of exemption. We actually need to have uh, the presence of state aid. 
And while it's direct subsidies, they are normally favoring certain undertakings. We have a different situation if we're looking at tax breaks. And here we have some case law of the European Court of Justice and some decision practice of the European Commission that actually allows tax constructions um, which give a certain part of a certain uh, certain companies within energy production puts gives them a tax advantage and thereafter when the court of justice is looking at them is putting them all in one basket so that there's actually no different treatment because other companies would not be compared to those that got the tax break from that moment on there is no selectivity anymore and that means that there is no state aid so we do not need to look at guidelines this can be done unnotified anyway. And the European Court of Justice uh, decided in, in, in case law that, that non-competitive goals such as environmental protection are not allowed to justify this kind of tax measures. So here's something that works already before we start with, uh, with the exemptions where uh, this proposal is, is looking at. My second remark is going into the area of antitrust, where the current note is a little bit more silent. Because here, let's say, the old discussion comes back, relationship between regulation and competition policy. And here I would uh, claim it is very important to make clear that competition policy should not stand in the way of regulation. And there is still something to gain in the sense if undertakings are cooperating with each other for the sake of environmental protection. There is reference made to the conditions in Article 101, Paragraph 3. But the reference that is made in the paper to Paragraph 3 um, ignores a bit the, uh, the, 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 the reasons presented by this article to not go through. So uh, in this sense, um, we should also have uh, a clear uh, statement at the level of Article 101 that there is no restriction of competition if there is a cooperation of undertakings for the sake of reaching environmental and sustainable goals. And that requires a different approach to consumer welfare when looking at the goal of competition law. And that means we have to include long-term benefits for consumers into the calculation of consumer, of consumer welfare, which then already brings us to a different discussion at level of paragraph one. The Commission also has a role to play here because they can adopt guidelines as how they are going to look at this. And here is precisely where the Dutch Competition Authority has made a first step uh, into including more of this kind of uh, behavior into the, into the assessment of competition law. Let me finally conclude at the paragraph on the democratization, which of course find now from a constitutional point of view, highly interesting. The paper is here saying that the um, co-decision of the European Parliament should be more involved into competition policy. And I believe this is something very much uh, to be welcomed. One has to see the very special structure of how, <clears throat> let's say, legislation works in competition law, because we have the primary law layer, we have secondary law, but we have also tertiary law. Uh, and that is basically what the Commission does on its own. And much of the stuff we are discussing here is what the Commission does on its own by being empowered through a council regulation. And as it currently stands, the European Parliament could at best be involved in the special legislative procedures where the council adopts regulations, but then empowering the commission. Currently, all the guidelines the commission is adopting in the state aid field, they are based on an empowerment in the secondary law from uh, 2015 was, this, uh, was, the, was, the, was the regulation adopted. And here, let's say there is a bit less of a role to play under the current treaty framework. So if there should be a strong role of European Parliament in streamlining competition policy, we really need to go to a fully fledged treaty change in order to do that. And that brings me to my very last remark and back to my entry statement. This requires a clear definition of what is the role of competition policy with regard to regulation. I do believe regulation has the prey and that the um, shortcomings of regulation also in terms of majority requirements to get regulation done in the EU should not bring us to put everything on competition law, but competition law must also say it is not neutral towards regulation, regulatory activities, and it should be more aligned to what was done in one branch in order to be supported by the other. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for that clarity again. And uh, I immediately hand over uh, to Dr. Dörte Fuki, 
she's director at the European Renewable Energies Federation. So exactly that industry, everybody wants to grow as fast as possible, even if uh, I know some politicians who do at the same time whatever they can to stop it. But I will leave some German election campaigning here out of uh, the room. But uh, um, so, Madame Fouquet, and I would like to remind everyone, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the F&A Q&A function, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sven, uh, for having us here. I'm representing RF. I'm also a lawyer, but I hope it's not taken against me all, neither. Um, I'm a director of RF since um, doomsdays and naturally the European Renewable Energies Federation, which is more the voice of the independent power producers and energy producers from all renewable sustainable sources. We have worked with the Commission over the years on many guidelines. Uh, I see Michaela Hall in your former hat. We, we worked together when, when you were still at the Commission. So also very happy to see you. And first of all, I would, I would second with uh, what Professor Repassi just said. Um, we, uh, the regulation is the most important thing. And, uh, and we have this, the environment and climate imperative is now the highest imperative I can I can think about uh, for the coming decade and for this uh, investment cycle, as as was said by Juliette, I we have only eight years, and this is just nothing uh, for for more important or advanced projects. So what we need is really. Uh, guidelines when it comes to support mechanisms, first of all, to member states who are who are flexible and adaptable and help deliver and not help hinder. So the um, the volume of uptake in in many regions of or in all regions of Europe is is amazingly high, which we need to to do, and that's the one thing. So for us also, ERF uh, is of the opinion. Can we can we talk about selectivity here in um, in many in many uh, uh, considerations? No, I come back to the to the uh, first judgment on Preuss Electra, um, and where there already was was a complete uh, a steered view on and a good view on what is the boundary of selectivity. And the boundary of selectivity, in my view, has increased because all sectors of of society have to decarbonize, and that is. Uh, that is a public interest. It's a general political measure. So that I keep for uh, up front. You can read it also in our one of the papers, which are on the Arab webpage. But when I come now to the to the uh, state aid guidelines, because there's also a place for state aid guidelines, there may be some singular things which are real selective, uh, especially new technology approaches. Um, we, we also want to say uh, that uh, unfortunately uh, these guidelines are not healing the big, um, the big downside and negative uh, thing from the guidelines who are still in force and meaning that at the time of the last guidelines, DG competition, unfortunately, was in a way, sorry, Mr. Weinstein, let loose to, um, to uh, put in, these, in the current guidelines that despite the regulation we had in the directive for renewables, who was at the same time considered, we had the old directive, then the new came just in parallel almost to the guidelines. And in both old directives, we had the liberty of member states to, to do their pathway to reach the targets. What the guidelines did, they changed the directive. And I, I still, I still uh, state this case in, in introducing the uh, priority of auctioning and of technology neutral tendering. That is something which has nothing to do with GD competition. It was, it was an appendix of uh, British neoliberalism. So we might think about it now since Britain has left. So that's a very, very important thing. But on our recommendation, so on our recommendation for the for the uh, current guidelines, it comes at no surprise that we that we are of the of the opinion that. Uh, we have to have, first of all, what we do not have any longer, a separate chapter and category of aid for renewables, because that's the big difference to the current guidelines that the new guidelines talk about. Um, I have an overview, I can give it to you. Uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emission, a very, um, I don't know why that term, and under that renewables must find their place. 
why? No, we want to keep on with a, with an own uh, specific aid category. Um, and, uh, and then we, we also uh, want to phase out mandatory bidding process as a rule. And, uh, and natural technology specific schemes should be the rule in order to get everybody on board. And I leave it to Josh to talk about the importance of that for community power. Um, where a bidding process is chosen, we are asking for the current exemption threshold to be raised and also in view of more technologies coming, uh, coming uh, online. We are, um, public consultation is always fine, but in, for the sake of time, we do have in the planning and permitting processes and in the, in the administrative orders under national regulations, we do have the public consultation. It's a given, it's established in law, be it from nature protection and be it from neighbor or whatever reasoning. So another public consultation when you only have very few months to get a project uh, in, in this timeline of eight years seems to us uh, an administrative burden, which is not, uh, which we cannot uh, reflect on. Um, we we do not find the definition uh, provided for so-called low carbon technologies. And we fear that this, this lack of definition and clarity might uh, create uh, uh, room for uh, backstage Johnny's uh, meaning fossil fuels and nuclear, even though we, we accept that nuclear, like in the current guideline, is fortunately excluded out of the guidelines. But this vague term for us is not, is not clear. CCS, CCU, CAM sequestration, uh, at one point we will need it when we have to be uh, above 100% greenhouse gas reduction quality in Europe. So we might need that for biomass. At the moment, over the last years, we only have found that, that is, uh, it's, it's a stumble block to, to get rid of, uh, of fossil fuel. Um, very briefly, uh, uh, the energy communities, I leave to Josh, uh, uh, the compensation for fossil fuel plants has nothing to do here and should be, should be done in a way that it is uh, in, a, in a separate notification scheme if, and then we have to say people who had, and I, I can only second you yet, people who were in that business of fossil fuel, coal and fossil gas, they knew when the commission came up with the binding national targets in, um, in, uh, for 2020, so that they knew there is no investment trust any longer because we are on the way to decarbonize the 2020-20 targets. So each new investment which came after that time has to be viewed very critical uh, uh, if they want to have some uh, phase out money or some uh, sunset money we are we are we are we we think that is something they have to bear themselves uh, so there should be that is a little bit what i hydrogen it's good it's in but it should only be from renewable sources and and again backstore johnnies who come back with uh, with whatever fossil fuel hydrogen should not have no place in under these guidelines. So that's that's roughly what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And as you were already uh, giving indirectly the floor to Josh Roberts, uh, I'll do that as well. And. Uh, Obviously, he's representing of renewable energy cooperatives. Uh, that's a specific subsector of the renewable industry, which is, of course, very close to my heart because uh, I'm also co-president of the Social Economy Intergroup. And if something annoys me since a long time, then that is, uh, um, in particular, uh, companies which are based on cooperation of uh, citizens or businesses are not treated the same or even worse uh, than initiatives which are for-profit companies, which goes against the neutrality principle of ownership in the European treaties. And uh, therefore, I'm particularly grateful for your presence, Josh, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven, for inviting us here. Indeed, we do represent uh, citizens coming together through energy cooperatives. Um, the new fancy word in the EU uh, bubble is renewable energy communities. 
And I would just like to start by jumping off of something that Dorita said. And she said that climate and environment is the highest imperative. If indeed this is true, and it is, citizens and local communities are an imperative to achieve this, uh, this objective. They are indispensable for a successful energy transition. And this is something that the EU legislature spent two years negotiating and deciding this is a fact. Uh, and they have put specific uh, policy uh, and legislation that the member states need to enact in order to make sure that, that citizens can come together, form these, these uh, entities and compete in the market. Uh, and perhaps this boggles some minds, uh, but I find a really, uh, I, I find a, uh, it's, it's, a con it's almost a contradiction. On one hand, you have people saying there is very little role for citizens in the energy transition. Uh, energy communities are somehow you know, a fancy fiction, which they are not. But on the other hand, you have competition policy and the state aid guidelines coming in and saying that they need to be treated exactly the same as any other market participant. Uh, and I feel we are uh, to our detriment overlooking uh, one of the fundamental EU legal principles of the internal market of the EU, which is that of equality. And equality does not say every market actor must be treated in, in a similar way in all instances, because if you are comparing apples with oranges to treat those the same way is in itself discrimination. Um, so we need to uh, regulate, we need to treat like things as like, and if they are in a different factual and legal situation, there is room for differentiated treatment that is of course proportionate. Um, and indeed, this is where the question of what is the role of citizens and local small market actors, because uh, we are not, uh, we are very cognizant of the fact that citizens in the internal market have very little market power. So I wonder why we uh, worry about them accumulating some market power. We need them to uh, achieve the renewables target. We should, we should, we should uh, embrace a little bit of market power because what they have is in the end going to be very little. Uh, and when that comes to the state aid guidelines, what we were really looking for from DG competition, and I'm afraid uh, our, our requests have gone uh, un unanswered, is that this is a uh, community energy has been around for a very long time. In fact, the first wind turbines in, in Denmark were built by citizens coming together in the form of cooperatives in the 1970s when decision makers were still obsessed uh, with, uh, with nuclear. Uh, and so they really helped build the foundations of the energy transition. Um, but uh, somehow, uh, this is uh, this is this is this is lost, and um, the the state aid guidelines have 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 failed to acknowledge this as a new legal concept. And so, what we are looking for, what the member states need with this new legal arrangement, uh, is the acknowledgement that um, the need to support uh, energy communities in in different situations is is a necessity. Uh, and that uh, the member states should have clear legal guidance. Right now, the draft state aid guidelines don't reference uh, renewable energy communities at all. So member states are left to figure out for themselves exactly how they are supposed to fulfill the requirements. And the way the existing guidelines are structured is such that a member state has a perverse incentive not to create something special or new uh, or to tailor their existing schemes for renewable energy communities because they have input exceptions to even public consultation, which from uh, energy communities as a market actor, they are impacted by a decision of a member state not to account for them in, this, in, in, in the design of their or amendment of their support schemes. Uh, so we shouldn't be encouraging member states to simplify their schemes so that they don't include energy communities. We need to be providing them with guidance on how to fulfill their legal obligations to support the growth of renewable energy communities. And at the heart of this comes to uh, competitive bidding and auctions. Dorta mentioned this. 
in the previous guidelines, this was uh, more or less the uh, objective to get all renewables to compete in this, but even the old guidelines stated that this might not be appropriate for small market actors. There is not even a reference to this in the new guidelines. And indeed, they lower the threshold for exempting small installations to 400 kilowatts, which is essentially nothing. It might as well not even exist. So if we're really going to, to treat and take seriously the differences of energy communities, we need to provide them with the space. And lastly, I'd like to point out that Competition policy should not be uh, an objective of itself. The creation of markets should not be an objective in themselves. They need to uh, be aligned and be balanced with other priorities. And when we are talking about renewables projects in local communities, there are negative externalities that those communities do have to face. And we need to be honest with the fact that this does increase uh, public resistance. Uh, but this can change if citizens and communities are given the, part the opportunity to participate. So when we are talking about, uh, you know, providing renewables at least cost, um, we need to balance social criteria in that because communities are not afraid of competitive bidding, but it needs to be on a level playing field. And we need to take into consideration aspects such as public acceptance and inclusiveness if we are really aligning this with the Green Deal. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Josh. And uh, we have received one question, which I would uh, immediately add to uh, the speaking time of Michaela Hall of Agora um, Energy, uh, which is the leading think tank uh, in Germany, but also on the European level on uh, questions of the energy transition. And the question comes from uh, yeah, uh, Burkhardt, uh, if it would show it, uh, Habe. Uh, the German government prevents democratic energy generation in order to protect traditional industries. What can the European Parliament do to break this behavior within short terms? So perhaps uh, you have some hints for me on this, Michaela, but uh, first and foremost, you have the floor. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm an economist, Sven. So I'm balancing the panel in gender and economist terms. Um, it has also already been revealed that until recently I was working in the commission and there at the last few years in the renewables unit. So. That's the perspective I can also bring to this debate. Um, so <clears throat> firstly to say that I, um, I had a quick look at the draft guidelines and I have to say, I think they go a long way into reinterpreting how state aid fits into a green deal environment. Um, I'm, I will point to a few things today that I criticize, but uh, there's also a lot which I think is really, we welcome. Uh, and for example, uh, just to pick one example is uh, that uh, the, the guidelines welcome new instruments. And I think that shows that the debate has evolved on how to support renewables, like for example, carbon contracts of difference, um, which uh, I think just reflects that the discussion is no longer black and white on this kind of things. And uh, we welcome these kind. Uh, I can also explain more on that. Uh, however, we also see a few, uh, a few issues that still could be improved. And as I said, I speak also with the renewables perspective in mind. Um, so a general comment. Um, last week uh, in the Financial Times, I read an article of, uh, from several, quite, uh, from several uh, business leaders in Europe, like Siemens and, and stuff, who basically said, when it comes to renewables, we see other economic areas like the US and China, and I would add also the UK to that, um, have a much more pragmatic approach in pushing their industries. And I think that's a message we should keep in mind also here for the state aids. Um, uh, I worked uh, last year when I was still in a commission on the, on the offshore strategy, offshore renewable strategy. And uh, someone said, make the discussion more, you know, provide examples. I will do that now. Um, the next big thing in renewables, which needs to be scaled up, is floating offshore wind energy. We have ambitious targets in there. Um, 
but they need they are they cannot be treated in the same pot necessarily as other renewables. We have renewables that are very mature and there are other uh, technologies that come up. So in the past, it was already very difficult to treat all the renewables in one go. And in the chapter now, we actually see that the pot in which the renewables are to be found is has become even bigger. And I wonder how this would be implemented in concrete terms, because I think one should not forget about this industry policy objective also. Um, we saw in the draft guidelines this reference that price is the most important, but other criteria can be added. Um, and I would like to say, if you, if you think about technology neutrality, if you push that, like for example, in your mobility chapter, where you basically, you are not specifically saying it will be electric vehicles for for the small vehicles, for the passenger vehicles, but you keep it open. Uh, that's not the advice Agora would give at this stage because for that segment of the market, I think the decision has taken, you will inevitably have to develop two sets of infrastructure. So you can focus on the price at the micro level, but I think the state aid guidelines should also be drafted in a way that we are not overly um, inflating what you pay at macro level for this energy transition. And so I think this should also come into the discussion. Um, and uh, that leads me to the final point. I, I can be short because much has already been said. Um, we, uh, we all know that at the moment a lot of discussion on hydrogen, which also appears in your, in your guidelines. Um, just to say that this I mean, this, it was said by, by various speakers, including also from the Commission, obviously state aid is one element and there's regulation and there are other elements. But what the state aid guidelines should reflect on is uh, for, in particular for green hydrogen, uh, if we want this to work, it's a scarce resource and there, there has to be some steering. And the steering will have to come hopefully in the clean energy package or Agora will you know, promote that this steering comes. So this goes only to the hard to decarbonize niches. That means it does not go to heating boilers. It does not go to, to, to low energy heat, but it goes to the heart, you know, where we really need it. And that I do not see reflected in the stated guidelines. And just to say, I mean, I'm reading this in conjunction with the clean energy package. Um, so I assume also that, for example, you know, whatever the renewables directive will say on biomass or what the taxonomy will say, will in the end be reflected also in this guidance, because some parts there are, are still undefined, as, as, as was already said, for example, the low carbon definition. So it's all a package, but I think that um, one should go a step further in moving towards the Green Deal and yeah, uh, reflect again on, you know, prioritization on overall costs and uh, technology neutrality. Thanks a lot. Yes, I understand the audience saying this debate is uh, on a certain level uh, quite abstract, although I felt that uh, when it was about renewable energy and cooperatives and renewable energy, it became a bit more concrete. Uh, however, uh, I knew why I've put this issue uh, for a lunchtime debate with a certain audience in mind. I was not sure whether Dörte signaled that she wants to come in on this, uh, then uh, with pleasure. Uh, otherwise, um, I, uh, the time is uh, already uh, uh, coming, uh, signaling the end. I would in any case uh, like to give the floor again to the Commission. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Mr. Winterstein is still. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Now the camera is back. Uh, Dirt, I was not sure whether you wanted the floor. Okay. So in this case, I would suggest uh, that uh, let's uh, listen to a reaction from uh, 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 the unknown power of DG Comp. So uh, please, uh, Alexander Winterstein. Um, well, first of all, many thanks to everybody uh, who spoke. There was a lot of uh, information which I've, um, which I've taken uh, down and which I will uh, give to my colleagues uh, who, um, as I said, are right now discussing the new guidelines with uh, 
the representatives of uh, of the member states uh, that will then look at the outcome of the public consultation and then of course uh, factor all this uh, factor all this in and i trust that uh, that many of you um, have have participated or will participate in this consultation so that we have it in writing um, as well um, i i'd like to to take out um, two points um, from what i heard one is uh, the remark that competition policy is not an end in itself and shouldn't you know, be seen as, a, as an objective in itself. Uh, and um, I hope that, um, that I was clear in what I said in the beginning, that of course, we do not see competition policy as being an end in itself. We see competition policy as a tool, actually a pretty powerful tool to achieve the objectives in the treaty and to achieve the political priorities of the EU and the Green Deal is obviously a very strong priority of, um, of this European Union and of this Commission. And what I tried to do in my opening statement is to explain how we think that competition policy will contribute to uh, the objectives of the Green Deal and the purpose of our consultations, and there are many consultations going on, the purpose of these consultations is exactly to find out how we should change our rules so that they can serve that purpose, that objective, better than they do today. And the uh, revision of the environmental aid guidelines, uh, which will have a different name, uh, by the way, afterwards, uh, the purpose of this objective is exactly that as well, to, um, to make sure that, that those guidelines uh, are perfectly geared towards helping member states channeling the investments where they're really needed and avoiding distortions of competition. So just to make that perfectly clear, it's not an, an end in itself, it's a tool to achieve other, um, other objectives, important ob objectives. And the second point, uh, Mr. Gigot, I'd like to come back to is the one on antitrust from one of the, the earlier speakers. Um, I think there is no need to, uh, to have a great upheaval in the way we look at Articles 101, uh, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 3. I, I don't think either that we need to change the welfare standards. But what I think we could look at is whether the way we, uh, we interpret uh, the uh, exemption in 101.3 um, could be, um, could be uh, amended could be improved. I think a lot can be achieved with regard to the objectives of the Green Deal um, with what uh, the, the, the current way of thinking on Article 1.3 already, or, already offers. I think there's more scope to actually work with that provision uh, as it is and with the, the kind of analysis and framework that we already have. And so I think the guidelines, uh, the horizontal guidelines will also um, Go a step in, clarif in clarification here and offer and offer more clarity there. And I think many people will see that there's a there's still a lot of things that can be done without you know changing the system uh, fundamentally. Uh, so these are the two points I wanted to make. Of course, I could reply, uh, Mr. Giggle, to all the, the the individual points, but I don't think that's very useful given that the public consultation is ongoing, discussions are are ongoing as we speak. So I think I would leave it to my colleagues to digest uh, the very detailed points on renewables and uh, energy communities and others. Um, and then uh, I'm sure you will have another webinar once, uh, once the new text is there, and probably not with me, but with uh, the team um, that is writing the new guidelines and is now discussing with the member states uh, today. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Uh, there's one question which I uh, would like to put to one of you. Perhaps you can point up if you you feel um, well prepared to answer that. And this is by Henning Wins. I will uh, translate into rough English. Uh, how can the globally relevant uh, market in state aid control be taken into account? In my view, uh, a multilateral agreement uh, would be well advised. Uh, how do you see this? So it's the old debate, uh, 
should Europe be strict on state aid while others are giving them out? And are we not a bit naive? I have noted that in the European Parliament, majorities have really shifted around this. So often I feel the Greens are the, uh, the, the last person standing defending uh, against this argument, uh, because I fully agree with you, Mr. Winterstein, that innovation and tough competition is a, a basis in order to, uh, to achieve uh, the green transformation. Uh, while um, uh, handing out uh, excessive state aid in all directions and pampering industry has in the end never helped anyone. Uh, so therefore, my a priori, uh, I'm a rather skeptical person. On the other hand, I see that this debate is alive and kicking, not only by those interested parties, but also by people seriously concerned about the common good. Anyone wants to answer that one? Maybe I can just um, uh, add one yes. element and then, and then maybe the, the panelists will, uh, will add further elements. I think, first, I agree with what you just said about the role of stated policy. And, and, and the benefits of that policy. Um, but it is, it is also true that there, um, we cannot close our eyes in front of the fact that uh, our companies are, are competing uh, within Europe also with uh, companies uh, that may uh, have received subsidies from other countries, from foreign jurisdictions. Um, uh, because, you know, being naive is never, is never a recipe for success. And, uh, and that's why we have put forward a proposal to, to look at foreign subsidies, um, which I think is a very good proposal and uh, which I hope will be, will be uh, going through uh, quickly. And that would allow actually uh, the commission to take into account um, subsidies uh, by, by third countries to companies which then compete here in Europe, which for example, try to, 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 uh, to buy another company uh, to participate in the tender or whatever. So I think, uh, I think that this is an important complement to the discipline that has served us so well within Europe and the, and the discipline for which the competition rules are the primary tool to, uh, to protect it. Um, I think this, this element of looking at foreign subsidies is an important um, complement. I just wanted to add that, but now we'll mute myself and see whether other panelists want to say something on this. Well, we can also leave it uh, for the time being here. And uh, it's, uh, we said one hour and lunchtime is a precious time for many people. So I thank you. Uh, I would only like to conclude by saying first, I would welcome uh, any more written feedback uh, on my draft paper. Thanks for all who have already given feedback. And uh, I will of course then also post it in time to the commission consultation that I have to do this is of course a bit ironic and has a lot to do with what René explained. Uh, and the commission has tremendous power with guidelines. Uh, often uh, the wordings in these guidelines have more power than uh, outright legislation. Uh, nevertheless, there is no di direct uh, democratic legitimation, which I would not like to have uh, on individual cases. But as these guidelines are Kasai law uh, and more generalized principles, I think uh, it is important to have a stronger parliamentary view. And this is so important here because the Euro European Commission with the parliament and the council have decided on a new lead strategy for Europe, which is the Green Deal. And therefore, I think uh, these guidelines in particular, but the competition, but competition policy as a whole, should take the best account of this new strategy. And this means for me that, and, and for us Greens, that first the logic of bridge technologies is over because climate science tells us we have to act fast. We have no time to bridge for bridges uh, which lead to nowhere. And uh, this means we have to move now to a zero carbon economy. And everybody knows we will have to do this in Europe earlier than 2050 in order to do our global fair share. And this means subsidies for new and state aid for new 
uh, infrastructure, but also other forms of investment in fossil energy are really for the past. And this uh, should be reflected uh, in the policies. Uh, and uh, second, I, I would also like to argue that we need uh, the flexibilities needed to help industry uh, to move to this uh, transition. We do not need uh, several subsidies for the same good. So we don't need at the same time um, um, carbon border adjustment, free allocation of, um, uh, of um, trading allowances under ETS and contracts for difference. So also there is a danger of over pampering and listening to all lobbies at the same time, then leading to absurd results. Uh, and uh, this will be already a hot debate uh, from tomorrow onwards. And um, I personally believe free allocation is the most primitive form of um, basically helping industry tra to transform. We can do better. We can do industrial policy in a more intelligent way with less negative side effects to the detriment uh, of consumers. And lastly, I would like to stress what has been said by, by Josh. It, it is absurd that um, we do not support wholeheartedly renewable energy uh, uh, communities. Uh, uh, I know it's normally cooperative communities doesn't sound so leftist, Josh. This is why they have invented that term. And um, But the point is um, the practice in Germany is from my perspective against the reform renewable energy directive, which has not been implemented correctly in Germany. Therefore, the question here uh, raised in the audience is already answered by co-legislators, but the big coalition in Germany failed to, um, to implement this properly. But for the commission, this new legislative basis should also have a consequence. So this means if we say, all member states are obliged to create a supportive framework for energy, renewable energy cooperatives, then the European Commission should do it as well. And therefore, this auctioning rule has to go. Uh, so this is far too strict. And, uh, and uh, I can only second what has been said there. So greetings to Margrethe Vestager. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to her proposals and uh, and we hope uh, that you will not disappoint uh, those who believe in the Green Deal as Europe's future strategy. So all the best, wish you well, have a great summer and uh, yeah, and uh, see you here then in September again in the show. Bye bye und tschüss und auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss.